Hello. Good morning. Can everyone hear me? Can everyone see me? Yes. We're in a new era. We're in a new angle. Um, hi. I hope you all had a great new year. I missed you. Did I see that the back of the class made a group? You made a group? What kind of group? That's so fun. Love your love. Um, hi, I'm standing. Yes, that's right. Uh, I have a standing desk. Um, and in fact, I'm standing on a treadmill because I even hopped on that TikTok trend and I got myself a desk treadmill. And uh, the problem <laughs> is that if you don't use your desk treadmill, then uh, it's worthless. So the problem, though, is that like I didn't really have a place to easily store the treadmill so I could easily pop it in and out. And so it was stored over there and I just never used it. And so I was like, OK, new rule. When I'm at the desk, I'm either standing or walking. And frankly, it feels way better to walk than to stand. Uh, standing in place kind of hurts my feet and my lower back. But walking feels great. Um, I walked 5,000 steps while I was getting ready for this show this morning. And it's only 8.30. So uh, new year, new me is basically what I'm saying. Okay. Okay. You invited me to the group. <clears throat> Where is it? Is it Facebook? Is it Instagram? Hold on. I'm pulling up my phone. Is it in the request? Where's the request? Um, let's see. Oh, I found it. Oh, Instagram hid it. It wasn't, it was not only in my like requests from people I don't know, it was in hidden requests, requests containing messages that may be offensive or unwanted are moved into this folder. That's embarrassing. All right. I have accepted your lovely invitation and I appreciate it so much. How fun is that? Okay. All right. I got it. I got you. Mm, Instagram group. Okay. Should we make a Facebook page? Is, do people do that? I don't know. Anyway. Hi, I hope you had a great holiday season. Uh, I feel like I've been out of touch with the news. I haven't really been paying attention, to be quite frank. I've been trying to, you know, not. Yeah, please not Facebook. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. I don't, I don't, I I'm have joined a couple Facebook groups and there are a lot of people who swear by Facebook and they like love their Facebook groups. Um, but yeah, that's, it's not for me. It's a no for me, dog. Moira has entered the room. We are like 6,000 away from hitting hundred K over on the main channel, which is when I promised you the pub cam. So it's coming. It's coming. Um, oh, another reason, the reason why I chose to move into the standing desk and like force myself to either stand or walk is because I've been doing a lot of work on this business that I'm launching February 1st, more news to come. Um, and I realize I'm having so much fun doing it, but when I'm really in the zone of working, I like am just sitting like this for like five hours straight, and my back has been fucking killing me. Like, can't like when I turn my head, it hurts. It's when I was 15, I could sit and play Sims for six hours straight, pop up, sit on my bed like this, playing Sims for six hours straight, pop up like nothing fucking happened. And now when I actually got fucking bills to pay, can't do it. Can't do it. So I need to stop feeling horrible. <laughs> um, and so I'm going to stand. And my acupuncturist would be very happy to hear that I'm walking more. Because it's good for your health. And apparently in traditional Chinese medicine, walking is the best thing you can do. Okay. Um, let's see. How did doggy boot camp go? Thanks for joining. Um, good. We are still working on it. F apparently four weeks is not enough to make your dog a perfect angel, even though she is a perfect angel. Obviously. Um, we're working on it. She has, um, she has some impulse control issues. Okay. Uh, she likes to get what she wants. 
and she always gets what she wants. And when she doesn't, she throws a tantrum. And so then she still gets what she wants. And so I've been kind of just reinforcing that she should uh, throw a tantrum and then that'll work. That's going to work for her, um, according to the to the trainer, which is fair, which is fair. So we're working on punishment, not corporal punishment. Um, timeouts. If I say no twice, she gets a timeout. She breaks the rules, time out in the crate. Um, she gets like something to chew on while she's in the crate because it's not so much punishment. It's more like you need to learn how to control your emotions. So I'm going to put you in the crate with this chew toy for you to chew and calm down. And the more times you break the rules, the longer you're in that crate for is what the trainer told me to do. Uh, I haven't been doing it every single time, though. So anyway, Pre Moira got presents for Christmas. She deserved coal. You hear that? You hear that? But um, I just wrapped, I got, I get bark bucks every month, bark box every month. And I just wrapped one of the, they got, she got like a little Christmas tree chew toy. So I wrapped it up. <coughs> it was really fun for her. <coughs> Uh, so, yeah, honestly, when, when the trainer was teaching me how to do it, I was like, oh, this is like training a child. So, great. Perfect. Not that I've had a child, and nor do I want one. This is enough. This is enough work. Okay. Uh, let's, get, let's get into the news. Let's get into the news. All right. Uh, oh, nope. That's not what I wanted to do. There we go. Okay. Hello. Hello. We're back. Okay. Um, first order of business, the January 6th committee yesterday dropped a huge treasure trove of evidence. Um, have I looked through it now? It was yesterday. I didn't have time. Most people haven't either, but Politico wrote us a handy dandy little article, uh, that explains some of what was disclosed. We got emails between Trump attorneys, text messages amongst horrified White House aides and outside advisors, internal communications among security and intelligence officials, all coming to grips with Donald Trump's last dish effort to subvert the 2020 election and its disastrous consequences. Okay. At one point, Trump lawyers strategized which federal courts would be likeliest to uphold their fringe constitutional theories about the 2020 election. Trump White House aides battled to keep unhinged theories from reaching the president's ears. As the January 6th attack unfolded, West Wing aides sent horrified messages about Trump's incendiary tweets and inaction. And after the attack, some Trump allies discussed continued efforts to derail the incoming Biden administration. This one felt pretty damning. Um, uh, it includes a January 22nd, 21 text be between Trump advisor Katrina Pearson and his longtime social media guru, Dan Scavino in which Scavino makes clear no one told Trump to author the tweet saying um, he does his own tweets. And the reason why, reason why that's, you know, damning is that with computer-based evidence, even if a tweet comes from a person's account, that is not definitive proof that that person tweeted that tweet. Anyone could have been behind that keyboard. Um, so this is just like an extra little link in the chain of linking Trump's actions to what happened on January 6th. Um, let's see. Bannon said he's not staying in the White House after the 20th, but who says we don't have 1 million people the next day? I'd surround the Capitol in total silence. So we got some, some damning words from Bannon, which is, I don't know, not that shocking to me, frankly. Um, we got a January 2 call log from, so we got the Trump call logs. The January 2 one denotes Trump's so it shows Trump's hour-long call with Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger in which he famously urged him to find enough votes to flip the election result to him. Um, and then immediately afterwards, on that same day, Trump had a Zoom meeting with Rudy Giuliani, a phone call with the chief of staff, Mark Meadows, and a 22-minute call with Bannon. So, like, basically they're saying it shows, like, a flurry of activity of him trying to, like, figure out how to, I don't know, get the election back in his favor. And then on the next day, he's contacting top Justice Department officials, contemplates elevating Jeffrey Clark to acting attorney general, which is a figure he viewed as sympathetic to his bid to stay in power. Um, 
And then a mass resignation threat by DOJ leaders prompted Trump to back away from the plan. Senator Mike Lee strategized with Trump attorney Clayta Mitchell about her effort to help the campaign to promote the notion that the 2020 election was tainted by fraud and irregularities. But Lee repeatedly pressed Mitchell on the slippery slope. He said her arguments entailed January 6th is a dangerous idea, not just for the republic itself, but also for the president. So we got like lawyers urging his lawyers to like not be fucking idiots. Um, Trump aide Hope Hicks texted with Ivanka Trump's chief of staff, Julie Radford, which like, why the fuck were we paying for Ivanka Trump to have a chief of staff? You know, that was coming out of taxes, our taxes, right? Anyway, I assume, I guess I'm assuming a chief of staff just sounds anyway. Um, all of us that didn't have jobs lined up will be perpetually unemployed. I'm so mad and upset. Hicks wrote, we all look like domestic terrorists now. Oh yes. I've been crying for an hour. Radford replied, not being dramatic, but looks like we are all fucked. Hicks continued. Alyssa looks like a genius. Hicks's message was an apparent reference to Alyssa Farah, a former Trump white house aide who departed the administration weeks before January 6th. And Hicks expressed outrage about his attack on Vice President Mike Pence in the midst of the violence, saying, what the fuck is wrong with him? So we got Hope Hicks out here having, having moral qualms. <laughs> um, and then, oh, it also includes a version of Trump's January 6th rally speech that shows how much he deviated from the written text and ad-libbed some of his most incendiary lines, which again shows that it was him. No one wrote that speech for him. He was not just following anyone else. It was him. Anyway. Um, oh, and then we got the, we got a journal entry from Kaylee McEnany, the Trump White House press secretary, um, describing some of the chaos, saying that he, Trump wanted to walk to the Capitol, like physically walk to the Capitol until Meadows said that it was not safe enough. She describes efforts to craft tweets with Trump responding to the violence at the Capitol, a call from Lindsey Graham worried about reports that the National Guard had been delayed and noted that Trump looked at the TV while Biden was delivering mar remarks on the attack. And so Biden calls for him to speak literally as he's filming his video address. Anyway. So, like, okay, none of that to me is, like, like smoking gun, huge bombshell, breaking news. Um, but I think the general quantity of evidence, the it just adds to what we already know was a pretty damning picture. Yeah, I mean, the movies, the content, we're going to get just analyzing what we've been through. Our children and our grandchildren will be like, or Emma, what was it like? Yeah, she spelled capital wrong. Yeah. Yes, totally. I think Trump believed he could walk in like an action hero with his mob behind him. Absolutely. This man is fucking delusional. Delusional. Ay, ay, ay. Yeah. Rich, white rich men find ways out of prison or short sentences. It's true. Yeah. So even if there's like any sort of conviction sometime down the line, 15 fucking years from now, because Lord knows it's going to take forever. Um, who knows what will actually happen? All right. Uh, okay. Moving on. Moving on. Kathy Hochul. Ooh, I just realized I think it's Hochul, but Hochul? Hochul. I maybe have only ever read that name and not actually said it out loud. I think it's Hochul. Sorry. Sorry. Maybe you shouldn't be getting your news from me. Um, governor Kathy Hochul was the first woman to be sworn in for a full term as New York State governor. She's uh, appealing for unity. She's like a moderate Democrat, but still, you know, you love to see it. You love to see it. Um, something you love to see less. George Santos is being sworn into the House on Tuesday as a representative from New York, same state as Kathy, despite the fact that his entire life is a lie, apparently. 
Uh, apparently, uh, representative. So he's been he's been lying about his background. That's the that's the the gist of it. He said he was in finance. He said a lot of things that people are slow. Like it's so slowly trickling out that it's absolutely not fucking true. Um, and in what I really like to be is a very petty move. Representative Richie Torres said he planned to introduce the Stop Another Non-Truthful Office Seeker Act, the Santos Act, that would require House candidates to provide details of their background under oath. Which I thought was fun and petty. Fun and petty. So let's look at some of the things he lied about. Mr. Santos has said that he grew up in a basement apartment in Jackson Heights, Queens. Until Wednesday, Mr. Santos's campaign biography said that his mother, Fatima de Volder, worked her way up to become the first female executive at a major financial institution. He has also said that she was in the South Tower of the World Trade Center during the September 11th, 2001, ta 2001 tax attacks and that she died a few years later. In fact, Ms. de Volder died in 2016... And a Brazilian community newspaper at the time described her as a cook. Which, like, I don't know. I don't know why you would need to, like, isn't it more impressive? If you're going to lie that you're in finances and you've gotten to an impressive place in finances, isn't it, isn't it more impressive to say that my mother is an immigrant and a cook and I love her and she's brilliant, but look how, look, I am the American dream. Isn't that, like, the Republican circle jerk that they're all looking for? Why lie about that? It's like all, all these things as we go through them, it's just like this man just seems as though he might be a serial liar. Like, you know, there's like some people that it's like an impulse control issue. Um, his apparent fabrications about his own life begin with his claims about his high school. He said he attended Horace Mann School, a prestigious private institution in the Bronx, and said he dropped out in 2006 before graduating and earning an equivalency diploma. A spokesman for Horace Mann said that the school had no record of his attending at all. Does he think people can't look this shit up? Does he think there aren't records? Like, okay, I'm not condoning it, but like if you lie on a resume about something like that, okay, fine. Maybe the job's not going to call Horace Mann School to confirm. Most hiring managers probably don't have the fucking time. But if you're running for office, you don't think people are going to look into that? Like, what? What? I don't understand. I, th I This is why I think it's got to be some sort of, like, addiction pro you know like some people are like addicted to lying for the thrill of it the same way that people get addicted to gambling it seems like like psychological at this point because logically it makes absolutely no fucking sense to lie about stuff like this by 2008 court records show mr santos and his mother were living in brazil just outside rio de janeiro in the city of net to Roy. Just a month before his 20th birthday, Mr. Santos entered a small clothing store and spent nearly $700 in 2008 dollars using a stolen checkbook and a false name, court records show. Mr. Santos has denied that he committed crimes in the United States or abroad, but the Brazilian record shows that he admitted the fraud to both the police and the shopkeeper. He wrote, I know I screwed up, but I want to pay in a message to the store's owner on Orkut, a popular social media website in Brazil, in August 2009. It was always my intention to pay, but I messed up. So maybe in his mind, he thinks that because he intended to pay, that he didn't commit a crime, even though he literally used a fake name and a stolen checkbook, which just stealing the checkbook was a crime. Like, on September 13th, 2011, a Brazilian judge ordered Mr. Santos to respond to the case. Three months later, a court official tried to subpoena him, but he could not be found. By that time, he was back in New York working at a Dish Network call center in College Point, Queens, company records show. He told some that he had been a journalist at a famous news organization in Brazil, but none could find his name on its website. He said that he was taking classes at Baruch College, but none of his friends remembered him studying. He bragged of Wall Street glory, but often seemed to be short on cash, at times borrowing from friends who he didn't always repay. He used to say he would get money from Citigroup. He was an investor. Oh, this is, okay, Mr. Vilarva is a boyfriend that he had for a while. Apparently, he told his boyfriend, he used to say that he would get money from Citigroup and he was an investor. One day it's one thing, one day it's another thing. He never, ever actually went to work. Things began to unravel between the two men in early 2015. Mr. Vilarva said after Mr. Santos surprised him with tickets to Hawaii that turned out not to exist. Around the same time, he said he discovered that his cell phone was missing and believed Mr. Santos had pawned it. 
like, <laughs> what is wrong with this man? I know. Don't bring the gays into it. And yet, even the gays can sometimes suck. Sometimes you find a gay that sucks. The second you think maybe per, maybe the, the Republicans are getting progressive, they find the most lunatic fucking gay in the bunch. <laughs> and they say, elect this man. Elect this man. This, um, not, okay, I'm not accusing, I'm not making any comparison in his actions to Jeffrey Epstein's actions, but it made me think of Jeffrey, Jeffrey Epstein because he lied his way into getting a job at a prestigious school in Manhattan, lied his way into meeting the parents of those children, and then lied his way into getting a job at a financial institution because of the connections he made in the job teaching kids that he lied about to even get to begin with. Jeffrey, Jeffrey Epstein. I just, there's something about, there's something about liars like that, that is just like something is not shooting right in the head, you know, not sh sorry, that's not, you know, things aren't firing is what I mean. I just thought that was fucking wild. Um, okay. I don't know if you guys have been, have been following this. Um, so if you haven't, a murder happened in Idaho, in the Idaho town of Moscow. Uh, four university students were stabbed to death in this home at the University of Idaho. They were found on November 13th. Um, and there was like no... People couldn't fucking figure out what happened. There were so there were four of them were killed, but there were two other roommates in the house at the time who slept through the attacks. So that's why people. It's just like I'm getting like chills even talking about it because it's just so freaky. It's a town. It's like a quiet town. It hadn't had a homicide in like seven years. Uh, no one could figure out a motive. Who did it? They couldn't find a murder weapon. Um, so it really scared like the whole town for, for, I mean, months up until now, because people weren't, there was a like mass murderer in the, in, on the loose somewhere. No one knew who did it and no one could tell if there was a motive or if it was a random killing. And that's kind of the thing that's spooky. There's also like spooky parallels to, uh, yeah, what's his name? The guy, you know, the serial killer, Ted Bundy. There's, there's parallels with Ted Bundy. Like, he also broke into a university house, all women. It was a sorority house. This is not a sorority house. Killed them in the night. So people just associate shit like that with, like, very scary things. Very, very scary things. Um, so I think the reason why it's just, it's just something that, like, I know we're all obsessed with true crime in this country worldwide really um and for me like i don't love reading or like listening to true crime things because um, i live in a house and when i lived in an apartment and it was like you know i was four floors up in an apartment with like 50 other units it was like fine but i live in a house and now i can't i can't do it i can't listen so um but there are certain stories that just like i don't know what it is about them they just like really grasp your attention even if you're not like a true crime junkie. And this one, I think just because it's like really young, like these were like 20, 19, 20 year old kids. Uh, no apparent motive might have been perpetrated by a complete stranger. There's just something grippingly horrifying about that, that I think is why everyone's been kind of watching. Um, okay. They have arrested a suspect now in connection with the deaths. His name is Brian Koberger. He's a 28-year-old graduate student. Um, and he had researched the mindsets of criminals, studied under a professor in Pennsylvania known for her expertise on serial killers, and for the last few months pursued a PhD in criminology at Washington State University about 10 miles from the Idaho crime scene. 
which when I read that, I was like, Washington State and Idaho are that close? Apparently. Little did you know you'd be getting a geography lesson today. But also, I'm pretty sure uh, Ted Bundy studied or tried to go to law school in Washington and then took a road trip and killed a bunch of people. You know, like there's just some things connecting. Okay. Uh, less than two months later, Mr. Koberger would be the subject of a criminal inquiry, arrested on Friday and charged with the murder of the four Idaho students. So then they kind of interviewed a bunch of people who knew this guy or know this guy, Brian. Um, former classmates and peers recalled that he had an analytical mind but could sometimes be cruel. A man named Thomas Arntz befriended him while riding the school bus around 2009. He said their friendship ended in 2014 after lighthearted ribbing and jabbing between friends turned mean-spirited with Mr. Koberger sometimes putting him in a headlock hold. Which now I'm... I... Okay, I guess, okay, I'm just saying that the math doesn't math there, but I think it's, they they met while riding the school bus, because yes, he would have been in high school in 2009, and then maybe 2014 they had graduated, but they were still friends, and then he just was mean to him. Over time, it just got so, so bad that I just shut down when I was around him, said Mr. Arns, now 26. I eventually just had to cut ties with him. Uh, Mr. Koberger had struggled with a heroin addiction beginning in high school, but it seemed to have moved past it in recent years. Um, Mr. Koberger had long been fascinated with why people acted the way they did and had seemed to enjoy his job as a security guard for the Pleasant Valley School District. Um, Mr. Koberger drove a white Hyundai, Hyundai Elantra, which is the same model of car that the police in Moscow said had been spotted near the Idaho victim's home on the night of the attacks. So we got, so we got some, we got a car. Other than that, though, the car, we don't really know what investigators have found that have connected him with the scene of the crime. They haven't released it because it's an ongoing investigation. So we know that he had the same car. Um, he seemed to show a particular interest in crime scenes and serial killers. In a post on Reddit from about seven months ago, a user who identified himself as Brian Koberger, which again, like I said, internet evidence like this, you can't say that it was necessarily 100% him, but the name matches. And that person sought people who had spent time in prison to take a survey about crimes they had committed. The survey listed Mr. Koberger as a student investigator working with two professors at DeSales, and it asked respondents to describe their thoughts, emotions, and actions from the beginning to the end of the crime commission process. So like just like the psychology of like during the crime itself, which to me indicates could be genuine intellectual psychological research could be someone who really wants to kill, but is afraid. And so he is asking others how it feels to get like the second degree high. I don't know. I'm fully making that up with no anything, nothing to back that up. Mr. Koberger then moved across the country to Pullman, Washington, where he began the fall semester in August in the graduate criminology program at Washington State University across the state border from the University of Idaho. The victims, Madison, Kaylee, Zanna, and, and Ethan, were attacked in at least two separate bedrooms, probably as they slept, according to investigators. The three women lived in the home, and Mr. Chapman was spending the night with his girlfriend. So... Okay, another student said Mr. Koberger seemed interested in the thought process of criminals while they committed crimes and less interested in the social factors that might lead people to do so, saying that he believed some people were just bound to break the law. The fellow student who spoke on the condition of anonymity because he feared that speaking publicly could jeopardize his safety described Mr. Koberger as the black sheep of the class, often taking contrarian viewpoints and sometimes getting into arguments with his peers, particularly women. So this guy sounded like a real fucking fun time. Just obsessed with serial killers and a raging misogynist. Doesn't look good. Officials pleaded for tips and videos while thousands of internet sleuths around the country suggested an array of people as the likely culprit, a former boyfriend of one of the victims, a man who was with two of the victims when they got a meal from a food truck, two roommates who were in the home when the killings occurred but apparently slept through them. 
The police had tried to tamp down rumors by ruling out several people of suspects, though accusations were flying so fast that at, at time it appeared at times appeared that they could not do so quickly enough. They withheld nearly all details of the investigation, raising frustrations and prompting some people, including the relatives of the victims, to wonder publicly whether the police were up to the task. This is an example of why, while I understand it, I also, I have um, the, the rise of internet sleuthing and obsession with true crime. I do take issue with it because um, you're not a, you're not an investigator. You, you maybe were trained. Some people maybe were trained in it and I don't mean to gatekeep, but like you don't have all the evidence in front of you. You don't, you weren't there. You're not privy to that, to a lot of information probably. The arrest left members of one Facebook discussion group with more than 166,000 members stunned. I'm baffled, one woman wrote. Literally everything we know doesn't make sense. Right, because you don't know everything. You don't know everything. Just because you have access to Google does not make you an expert. And when people start throwing accusations around, very innocent people could be pulled in and they could have their lives ruined because of these accusations. And as much as our criminal justice system is fucked, I do believe in the innocent until proven guilty thing. That little thing, that little thing I still believe in. Um, and on the flip side, of course, we have murders and crimes and things that like come back into light and get solved or in like the Adnan Syed case, like he got his conviction overturned because of a podcast, you know? So like there is some good that comes from it. So it's kind of, I don't know, it's a, I don't have the right answer for it, but there is, it does give me pause when some random person on a Facebook group says I'm baffled. Literally everything we know doesn't make sense. You know, you don't know everything. So. Yeah, I like that line in the sand. Sleuths are needed for otherwise neglected cases. I think that makes sense. Like, hey, let's reopen this case. I think sleuths should be more focused on the cases of like missing and murdered women from who are like black, brown, indigenous women. Um, all the women in this case, all the people murdered in this case were white. Um, and when white women get murdered, it's going to get more attention. So I think internet sleuths should take the prerogative and really try to bring cases to light that like are not being covered. <sighs> okay, I like that too. Sleuths are great for comparing missing persons with Jane Doe's and connecting similar cases from different areas, but they need to stay out of real time. I think that makes sense. I like that. I like that line. Seems like he was a dick, but nothing immediately screams classic serial killer. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think we know enough about him. I don't think we know enough about him. And again, I do believe in the innocent until proven guilty thing. And there are a lot of people who find crime psychology fascinating, who have consumed every single piece of media ever made about serial killers. Um, and we don't automatically assume they're serial killers. And if we did... There'd be a lot of serial killers in our midst, okay? Because there's a lot of people who are fucking very interested in stuff like that. So I don't know. I think um, it's too early to tell. But something, they had to have found something that we don't know because they haven't shared it with us yet. They had to have found something that connected him with the crime above and beyond the car. Because a lot of people drive a white Hyundai Elantra and if they're going to arrest every person who does, then... That wouldn't make sense. So there's got to have been something. We just don't know it yet because it's an ongoing thing and we probably should. Uh... Then again, I'm not going to say we should probably trust the cops. So like I said, I don't have an answer. It's a fascinating conversation we could have. Ooh, that's a good you. That's a good video idea. Hold on. Let me write that down. Because I feel like there's a lot of research I could do about like the problem with amateur sleuths. Through crime obsession. There's something there. And I feel like I have a lot of thoughts on it that I've been thinking for a while. 
Thanks. Thanks for the idea, brain. All right. Okay, let me get back to my notes. Hold on. Hold your horses. Okay. So that's that. Um, moving on to not really anything any more uplifting. So back in 2021, there was a grocery store shooting in Colorado that killed 10 people. If you're like me, you forgot about it because there have been so many since. When I originally read grocery store shooting in this article, I thought they meant the one in Buffalo, New York. Because there have been more than one and I've lost track. And that's the world we live in. That's the country we live in, specifically. Apparently, two days after this shooting at the Colorado grocery store, two days after that, in a Publix in Atlanta, Georgia, a man entered the store carrying four handguns and a guitar bag holding a semi-automatic ri rifle and a 12-gauge shotgun. There's a picture of it. He went into a Publix with all this. I'm not going to show it for too long. I'm going to get censored. Um, with all that, he went into the bathroom in the Publix. Um, he leaned his AR-15 semi-automatic rifle against a wall to take a piss, I guess. I don't know. And a guy in there with him reported him to authorities, which caused the entire store to evacuate. And he got arrested as he was leaving the bathroom, which meant he was in there for a while. So I don't know if he was taking a shit or what. The guy who was in there with him said it sounded like he was like cleaning them, loading them. Stuff you don't really want in a public bathroom, you know? Anyway, there's a legal quandary here, though. He was carrying guns in a public place. And under Georgia law, he was allowed to do that in public. He purchased them illegally. He purchased them legally. They're an open carry state. He was allowed to do that. But he also caused mass panic and a public evacuation. So what can he be charged with? Was he breaking the law? That's the question. Um, his name's Mr. Marley. His attack kicked off, or his arrest kicked off a long and as yet unresolved legal odyssey in which the criminal justice system waffled over what it could charge him with and whether to set him free. Clearly, visiting the grocery store with a trove of guns had frightened people, but was it illegal? Um, Chuck Wexler, the executive director of the Police Executive Research Forum, a bipartisan law enforcement policy group, said police officers sometimes had mere seconds to determine whether a person with a gun either legally has the right or he's a madman or both, which often happens. So prosecutors initially went all in on his case, this guy that entered the public's grocery store, charging him with 11 felonies, five counts of criminal attempt to commit a felony, six counts of possession of a weapon during commission of or attempt to commit certain felonies. An arresting officer said in an affidavit that when Mr. Marley had put on his anti-ballistic armor, he had anti-ballistic armor on, on top of all of these guns. When he put on his anti-ballistic armor in the public's bathroom and placed the handguns with rounds in the chambers into his pockets, he had taken a substantial step of the crime of aggravated assault, which is a felony. I think that's a fair thing to say. Why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? What are you doing that for? What are you doing that for? In July 2021, Judge Debbie Ann Rickman of Fulton County Magistrate Court denied Mr. Marley Bond, determining that he posed a significant danger to the community. But court records show that the charges were dismissed. In February 2022, Mr. Marley was released from jail after 10 months, only to be rebooked in May a couple months later, this time after being indicted by a grand jury on 10 lesser counts of reckless conduct, which is a misdemeanor. The indictment says that Mr. Marley was loading and displaying his AR-15 in the restroom and that he left it unattended. And he pleaded not guilty to those charges in August, and he remains in custody. Mr. Bryant, his lawyer, said he had not filed a new bond motion on his client's behalf because Mr. Marley is homeless and did not have family or friends to stay with. And then his lawyer said, I mean, all the guy did was be in the store with guns. I go into Kroger with a gun and I don't expect to be arrested for reckless conduct when I do that. Based on the information from the case, he didn't do anything that would even remotely constitute reckless conduct. And shame on the state for even prosecuting him for that. Are you fucking kidding? The level of deluded you have to be to say, based on all these facts, he didn't do anything that would even remotely constitute reckless conduct? Are you fucking kidding? An entire grocery store was evacuated because people were fucking terrified. Like, that is just a denial of reality. You have to be lying to yourself to think that's true. 
that's abhorrent. In February, a man named Guido Guido Herrera was discovered at the Galleria Mall in Houston, a few yards from a youth dance competition, wearing a spiked leather mask and carrying a Bible and an AR-15 style rifle. Which, by the way, AR-15s are the favorite of mass shooters. Both these men had them. An off-duty police officer working as a security guard was alerted to his presence and tackled him. Mr. Herrera was found to have more than 120 rounds of ammunition with him, as well as a semi-automatic handgun holstered in his waistband. He was charged with this order. He was charged with disorderly conduct, a misdemeanor that under Texas law includes knowingly displaying a firearm in public in a manner calculated to alarm. A jury found him guilty, and he was given a six-month jail sentence. He took advantage of some technicalities in the law. He had the right to have that firearm, and ultimately, this was the only charge that we could get him on. So this is a matter of the law, like how the laws are written, where doing things like this with guns in public is permissible or questionable at best. Nathan Beadle, the Misdemeanor Trial Bureau Chief in Harris County Prosecutor's Office, pointed to, a to the practical challenges of applying the legal standard. How long does it take to go from in a manner calculated to alarm to deadly conduct? A millisecond, right? Right. You could be loading a gun menacingly and then one millisecond later shooting people with it. Like, how do we know? Where's the line? How far do they have to go down the road of in a manner calculated to harm for it to be punishable by law? And if we have to allow people to go that far, they're going to start just killing people. Not all such cases have ended peacefully. In 2015, a woman in Colorado Springs called 911 after seeing a man in her neighborhood with a gun. The dispatcher reportedly explained to her that Colorado was an open carry state. Within minutes, the man went on a shooting spree, killing three people. That gives me fucking goosebumps. That gives me the fucking heebie-jeebies. While in the public's men's room, Mr. Brandt, uh, the man who was in there and called the authorities, said Mr. Marley had taken out some of the weapons, including the rifle, to clean them. Oh, no, no, no. Mr. Brandt is his lawyer. <laughs> that, this was funny. Um, his lawyer claims that Mr. Marley took out the weapons, including the rifle, to clean them after discovering that some guacamole had bought, he had bought caused a mess inside the bag. So he just threw an open can of guac in the guitar bag holding his AR-15 is what we're supposed to believe. And then, okay, do you remember Fanny T. Willis? We've heard her. We've heard her name before. She's the district attorney in Fulton County. She's the one that's investigating Trump on that call he made to the Georgia election official asking him to find more votes. We love Fannie T. Willis. We love Fannie. She said, Georgia's General Assembly must examine our statutes governing this type of behavior. Referring to the state's Republican-controlled legislature, respecting the right to bear arms should not require that we tolerate people entering public spaces with assault rifles and body armor. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think that's a fair statement. And then this guy's lawyer says, what is the definition of reckless conduct? Carrying weapons in a state that requires no permit and no license? I mean, help me understand. What's the reckless conduct? And as much as I think he's fucking deluded, he also has a point. He has a point, and this is why the laws need to be rewritten. Because it's not clear what quantifies qualifies as reckless conduct when you are in a state where people can just wield guns loaded willy-nilly, apparently. And there's nothing that can be done. And uh, this whole story should have been under the, the banner, get me the fuck out of here. Get me out of here. Relatedly, people can now carry guns without a license in half of the United States. Half of the states, 25 states, now allow people to carry guns without a license. Without a license. 13 years ago, only two states, Vermont and Alaska, allowed its residents the unfettered right to carry a gun, relying on the Constitution's Second Amendment as a blanket permit for all. Since 2010, however, nearly two dozen states have allowed have followed suit, with 11 of them passing permitless carry laws in the last three years alone. And that, my friends, is the pendulum swing of culture and policy and politics. We had Trump. I mean, it was growing before Trump. And then we had Trump. And then... And then Trump gets, does not get reelected. And in the last three years since he was not reelected, 11 states have pa passed permitless carrying laws. 
Oh, and then the <laughs> this photo is apparently during an NRA concealed carry fashion show back in 2017 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And if this ain't the gayest fucking picture I have ever seen in my entire life, what are we doing? Okay, so the state legal changes have dovetailed with two other trends that augur well for gun advocates. First, the COVID-19 pandemic unleashed an unprecedented surge in sales. And second, people of color and women made up a larger share of the buyers, diversifying a gun buying public that has traditionally skewed male, white, and conservative. So like the, the market is growing for guns here, which <laughs> I don't like it. Like I don't want anyone armed. This is not an area where I'd like equality, <laughs> okay? Gun violence has also spiked since the pandemic began with firearm deaths jumping 20% from 2019 to 2021. With big ticket gun reforms like the assault weapons ban or universal background checks stalled in Congress, the spate of state laws marks a defeat for the reform movement, which views the trend as a public security threat. It's no coincidence that in states with very permissive approaches to guns in public, you have higher rates of gun death says Adam Skaggs, chief counsel for the Giffords Law Center, a nonpartisan reform group. Over the last five years, researchers have increasingly shown that loosening restrictions on carrying handguns is also associated with problems like increased gun theft and road rage incidents. Letting more people carry guns also impedes police work, Donahue said, partly from upticks in their caseloads of gun thefts and accidental shootings, and partly because ramping up the risk of getting shot reduces public police efficiency. So the same people who are carrying guns and touting the Second Amendment, Second Amendment, and who say, we love our boys in blue, blue lives matter, are also putting blue lives at greater risk and making their jobs harder because of their incessant need to be armed to the fucking teeth for absolutely no reason. Make it make sense. Make it make sense. Make it make sense. Okay, there is one, one point to, to note here for this data, tallying the number of states with permitless carrying laws can exaggerate their reach. They tend to be small states with rural populations, while larger, more urban states like California and New, New, and New York tend to favor a more restrictive approach towards firearms. So just over one third of the population lives in the 25 states embracing permitless carry. So half the states allow permitless carry, but only a third of the population lives in those 25 states. You feel me? So like the threat is made to seem larger than it actually is when you say that stat. Am I more comfortable that that still is, I'm still not comfortable. Does that, does that make me sleep better at night? Nope. Sure doesn't. I don't live in a state that allows permitless carry and I still am uncomfortable. I don't like it. I think that's all I had to say on this one. So yeah, you hate to see it. Let's, let's look at your comments. Yeah, I need off this continent. Same. Same. Yeah, and then you have Texas, the second largest state by population. So, like, that's still, yeah, a big yikes. Yikes. I hate it. Right, it's not for no reason. They want to be prepared for civil war. They're going to be war heroes. All right, hold on. I'm getting a text message. Oh, no. I got a, an appointment canceled today. Sorry. Should I be texting? Should I be checking my text messages while live on air? Probably not. Why don't they want proper checks? Because they don't want big government. They don't want the government to be able to tell them anything, I think. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Sisters are getting guns. That's something I've heard too. And I feel like ownership amongst black Americans of guns is a different conversation that I don't think I'm qualified to have, but it feels different when black people arm themselves than when white people arm themselves. Am I right? That's a discussion for another day that with someone who knows more about it than I do. Oh, that picture, right? I mean, what the fuck? The homoeroticism on the right never ceases to amaze. Never ceases to amaze. So fucking fruity. Ay, ay, ay. Ay, ay, ay. Okay, it's like, it's late, you guys. I still have other things I want to talk about. Okay, moving on. Moving on. 
I guess I'll remove the get me out of here banner, though. I think it would apply to most stories that I talk about. Okay. <sighs> So in Supreme Court news, Chief Justice John Roberts released his annual report on the state of the federal judiciary, which is something he does annually, thus the annual report. It left much, much to be desired. It, met, it left much to be desired. It shed no light on the investigation into the leak of a draft opinion in May or on calls for more rigorous ethics rules for justices, two things that seem important important to the state of the judiciary. At the end of a wrenching year at the Supreme Court, Chief Justice John G. Roberts Jr. devoted his annual report to threats to judges' judges's physical safety. The law requires every judge to swear an oath to perform his or her work without fear or favor, but we must support judges by ensuring their safety, he wrote. A judicial system cannot and should not live in fear. Some observers had hoped that the Chief Justice would use his year-end report for an update on the investigation announced in May into the leak of a draft opinion eliminating the constitutional right to abortion. Others had wished that he would announce revisions to judicial ethics rules in the wake of revelations about the efforts of Virginia Thomas, the wife of Justice Clarence Thomas, to overturn democracy. Yeah, I would love an ethics investigation or any ethics rules at all. Did you know that judges generally have written rules, written ethics rules they must follow. Lawyers have very specific written ethics rules we must follow. We must take a test specifically on ethics. Prior to taking the bar, we have to pass an ethics test. There is a whole book. There is a state ethics board for every state where you practice. There's a lot of rules. We have to take a class on it in law school. Like, Ethics are huge. Do people follow them? No, that's why lawyers have a bad reputation. But at least they're written down and they exist. Supreme Court justices do not have the same. They do not have a written code of ethics. Inexplicably. I'm sure there's a historical reason for it, but it makes no fucking sense. It makes no sense. And because of that, we don't have specific rules around when they should recuse themselves. Most justices tend to be very careful and tend to recuse themselves from cases where there might even be the hint of some sort of special interest. And a lot of the times have their spouses, their children, even like their cousins, step down from any sort of public position so as not to hurt their ability to be or at least appear impartial. Not Justice Clarence Thomas, though. No, no, he sees no reason why his wife's activities in trying to overthrow democracy should get in, in the way of his ability to be a Supreme Court fucking justice. <sighs> but instead of all of that, Chief Justice Roberts focused on a historical episode in the aftermath of Brown v. Board of Education, drawing lessons for it. The events of Little Rock teach about the importance of rule by law instead of by mob. Chief Justice Roberts recounted the bravery of a judge in 1957, three years after a unanimous Supreme Court ruled in Brown that segregated public schools violated the Constitution. Not everyone was convinced, the Chief Justice wrote. Among the officials opposed to the Brown ruling was Governor Orville Faubus of Arkansas, who ordered the state's National Guard to prevent black school children from entering Central High School in Little Rock. He's comparing <coughs> the justices now and their security concerns and their bravery in the face of their security concerns with the, the vitriol that the justices had to endure after finding in favor of desegregation in Brown v. Borgman. Do you know how fucking insulting that is on every level? Oh, Brett Kavanaugh's scared. We're just like them. Fuck off. <sighs> And then, so he also says Judge Davies, who's the judge that ruled in the case, had no idea what cases he would draw upon his arrival. But when it came time to rule in the school desegregation litigation, Davies did not flinch. Timothy Davies, the judge's son, told the New York Times that his father had not found the case difficult. He always said those decisions could be made by anyone who could read or write. The law was clear and there was nothing to decide. <laughs> so the son's like, get the fuck off your high horse. He just followed what the law said, which is what they're supposed to fucking do. And that's not what they're doing. They are, they have end goals. A lot of legal scholars are saying this. They are seeing a pattern in the Supreme Court where the justices seem to be deciding the outcome they want of a case and then finding law that backs it up, which is not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to follow the law to the logical legal conclusion 
whether you like it or not. Oh, it pisses me off. All right, we got to move on. Uh, there was an AI interview or an interview with the New York Times from an AI pioneer on what we should really fear about AI, which I thought was, uh, you know, interesting. You could read the whole thing. So she says that our gravest concerns should probably be tempered. At least that's according to the computer scientist, Ye Jin Choi, a 2022 recipient of the prestigious MacArthur Genius Grant, who has been doing groundbreaking research on developing common sense and ethical reasoning in AI. There's a bit of a hype around AI potential as well as AI fear, admits Choi, who's 45, which isn't to say the story of humans and AI will be without its surprises. It has the feeling of an adventure. You're exploring this unknown territory. You see something unexpected and you feel like I want to find out what else is out there. Um, she says, humans have this tendency to believe that if AI can do something smart like translation or chess, then it must be really good at all the easy stuff too. But the truth is what's easy for machines can be hard for humans and vice versa. You'd be surprised at how AI struggles with basic common sense. It's crazy. Uh, she says, let me give you an example. You and I know birds can fly. We know penguins generally cannot. So AI researchers thought we can code this up. Birds usually fly except for penguins. But in fact, exceptions are the challenge for common sense rules. Newborn baby birds cannot fly. Birds covered in oil cannot fly. Birds who are injured cannot fly. Birds in a cage cannot fly. The point being, exceptions are not exceptional. And you and I can think of them even though nobody told us. It's a fascinating capability and it's not so easy for AI. Common sense tells you that a bird in a cage cannot fly. It's obvious, but AI struggles with something like that. If you look at the average performance of something like chat GPT, it's so far from robust human intelligence. We should look at the average case because when you pick one best performance, that's actually human intelligence doing the hard work of selection. The other thing is, although the advancements are exciting in many ways, there are so many things it cannot do well. I don't know. I just found this comforting because a lot of people are up in fucking arms about AI and like the potential overthrow of humanity and AI becoming sentient and whatnot. And she is like, Calm the fuck down because she spends every day with AI and she knows its limitations. So I found that calming. All right. And then we're in, let's, let's just go quickly into climate corner. Um, this is good news. This is good news. Okay. Composting could save our planet. Do you compost? I compost. I have my little bin by my sink. And then the city of Minneapolis has little green bins outside and put it in there. And then they come and they take it. Though sometimes some assholes who are walking by my house because my bins are out front will put some random shit in my compost bin. And then I get a little note from the city being like, no, no. Here's how to compost correctly. I know how to compost correctly. It's these assholes taking their like dog shit and putting it in my compost bin. That's a discussion for another day. Okay, so... Oh, I also um, struggle a lot with uh, fruit flies in the summer. So if you have any suggestions, highly appreciated. Thanks. Okay. So apparently when food rots in landfills, it generates methane, which is a greenhouse gas far more potent, potent than carbon dioxide. Um, but, and in the United States, food waste is responsible for twice as many greenhouse gas emissions as commercial aviation. We always talk about how planes are hugely polluting, but food waste is responsible for twice as much greenhouse gas as commercial aviation, leading some experts to believe that reducing food waste is one of our best shots at com combating climate change. And what's thrilling about that is that's something that everyone can do. It was going to require a culture shift because not everyone composts, but it's something that we can do day to day. It's a change we can make that actually makes a difference. And I know there's a lot of arguments that like, the big polluting companies should be the ones to, to deal with this. Yes, but they're not gonna. So we got to do it and we can do it is the point. Like there's there's positive evidence out there showing that actual small changes that individuals make can make a huge difference. <clears throat> um, and food waste is the single biggest item entering the landfill. Households account for 39% of food waste in the United States, more than restaurants, grocery stores, or farms. Again, Yes, restaurants and grocery stores waste a lot of food, but 39% of that food waste come, happens in our household. So it's something that we as individuals can do to be better. And one third of the food in this country goes unsold or uneaten. A third of all the food produced, think of all the farmland, all of the labor that's underpaid in this country to produce food, all of the food that is imported, all of the greenhouse gases created in, in the importation of food, the labor that it takes for the food that's 
outside of the United States to be grown and then imported, a third of that goes unsold or uneaten. Evidence of a culture that takes abundance for granted. Um, and then they interview this guy, <laughs> Kyle O'Keefe, the director of innovation and programs for the Solid Waste Authority of Central Ohio. Daddy. I didn't have anything else to say about him. Uh, yeah, that's it. Compost, people. Try it out. You can get a compost bin in your backyard. If your city doesn't do it, you could use it in your gardening. There are even a lot of YouTube videos out there on um, urban composting, uh, how to do it in your apartment. There's a lot of resources out there to learn how to compost. And I find it very satisfying because you can really you can really reduce a lot of your waste if you compost. It's, it's surprising how much of your waste is compostable. <sighs> Here. Let's see. I need this article to send to my partner. Here you go. Ooh. There's a link. There's the link. And there are also people starving. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's all compost. Let's all compost. Um... Um, but if anyone has any ideas on how to reduce fruit flies in the compost bin, that would be great. That would be great. Uh, I'm just reading all your comments now. Municipal composting, great. Look up your composting options. So many ideas, so many options. So many options. Robin City just started composting. That's great. Luna needs to figure out how to get their city to uh, start composting. Okay, well, this article that I just posted the link to, that's what happened. I think it was like a little kid. Like this little girl was got really sad. This little girl got really sad because she learned about food waste and then watched her mom throw away a bunch of moldy food they found at the back of the fridge. And then she cried. And I think it started a movement. So maybe cry to your mom. Start, start there. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. God. Apartment complex doesn't compost. Do you have a friend who's does that you can like bring your little bag over to? And I know some cities, like I know in Boston, they didn't like come pick up the compost, but they had like composting centers you could bring your compost to, which like a lot harder. Like they should pick up composting because like people are, people need the most convenient option if, if actual change is going to happen. But it's a start. It's a start. I know Moira. <clears throat> she is out cold. It's her uh, morning nap time. This is 930. This is the longest live we've ever had. It's been over an hour, people. It's been over an hour. Um, and that's all I had for you in terms of news. Let's wrap it up with consumption corner, consumption corner. What have you guys been consuming? I finished the last of the Harry Potter books. I've finished rereading all of them. I got a comment or two once recently from people being like, you should be ashamed. <laughs> you should be ashamed for talking about Harry Potter or reading Harry Potter. You're a turf by association. Listen, I've never not said that J.K. Rowling's a turf. I've never not acknowledged that. I've never, I haven't given her money. I'm reading 15 year old books. We all know she's a turf. Uh, if you're gonna get mad every single time someone mentions Harry Potter, you're gonna lead a very difficult life. I was reliving my childhood back up off my balls. Um, and now I'm done. And so I'm gonna start reading other books because the whole point of me rereading, um, Harry Potter was honestly also to get me in the habit of reading again, because with law school, I just like stopped reading for fun because I was reading so much and I just like lost the habit. And then with COVID, I was just like during COVID, I was just fucking depressed and reading a book sounded awful. I just wanted to scroll, scroll on TikTok. So um, so I read it. I'm back in the habit. I'm going to start reading other things. I've been reading some nonfiction books, but I need like a good fiction to read. So if anyone, and I just upgraded my Kindle. Turns out you can trade in your Kindle to Amazon and you can get 20% off a new Kindle. And my Kindle's like a decade old. So that's frankly a good deal. So um, 
I'm upgrading my Kindle because I was finding I'm reading my my iPad before bed, which is just like a bunch of blue light. And I so I want to be reading off my Kindle. Um, so yeah, give me give me your book Rex. Give me your book Rex. And um happy to read. Okay, let me let me read all your all your comments. Word slut and cultish. That's actually, yes. I really like sounds like a cult, the podcast. So cultish, I should read it. I should read that. Let's see. It's still promotion of her. I'm not promoting it. I'm saying I read it. I'm not saying you should go read it. I'm not saying, have you guys heard of this book called Harry Potter? It's amazing. It's been like 25 years since Harry Potter came out. I'm not doing anything to build or retract from that reputation. There's nothing I'm going to, there's nothing that changes about it. Yeah. Just don't give her money. Don't give her money. JK is the one who should be ashamed. You're right. Oh, I've seen Heartstopper. Ooh, that's a good one. Oh, I love that one. We love bisexuality. We love bisexual visibility. Oh my God. So good. And I just watched the uh, Tra Tracy, Trixie and Katya react to Heartstopper on I Like to Watch. And if I watched that. That's like an, it's like an hour long episode, but it was real fun. Well, it was fun, except for I thought that Trixie's comments were a bit um, biphobic. Is that not biphobic, but they were like kind of ignorant. Like she really was so confused why someone would be confused about whether or not they're gay. As though like you can't contemplate like how fucking confusing it is to be bisexual. Like I've never been gay. I've been bisexual. I've never been gay, but I assume if you don't like one sex and you do like the other sex, if we're talking on a complete gender binary, which I know is incorrect, it's a little bit less confusing. If you're like, I've never liked a girl and I've always liked boys. Great. I've liked all of them <laughs> since I was eight and growing up in a small town where bisexuality wasn't an option, I was like, okay, I'm either gay or I'm straight. And I know I like boys and it's a lot fucking easier to be straight in this world. And I don't want to be gay because I like boys. Even if I like girls, I'm just going to go the easy route and I'm going to say I'm straight. But I'm always going to wonder and I'm going to feel a lot of fucking shame about my sexuality generally that I'm going to build and, and keep inside of me until therapy in my mid-20s. That's what it's like to be a bisexual kid. It's fucking confusing. Of course he Googled, what is bisexuality? Am I bi? And took a gay test. It's fucking confusing because it's not an option because there's so much erasure, which is why I'm screaming about it. I couldn't tell you the, the percentage of my female friends who are, who came out as bisexual in their mid to late twenties, oftentimes after dating long-term and even marrying cis men so many like a, a strange percentage of my female friends there's a lot of us out there and it's because it's very confusing and it's a lot easier to just ignore it and tamp it down because you can be straight passing and it's a hell of a lot easier <sighs> See, thankfully my mom is bi and told us all about queer people at like six, seven or eight. That's amazing. That's beautiful. I did not have anyone, not only did I not have anyone to tell me about bisexuality, I only had society telling me that bisexuality doesn't exist and you're either a woman who is lying and saying that she also likes men but is really secretly just a full-blown lesbian or you're a man who's lying and saying you still like women but really you just like boys. Like it's it's, it's, it teaches you to doubt yourself and what you know about yourself because you're constantly being told that you're lying to yourself and to everyone around you and that you're actually just a full raging lesbian. It's so confusing. It's so confusing. So anyway, I just wanted to put that out there because I found Trixie's comments to be really insensitive in that area and really ignorant. So that bothered me. And I know a lot of you watch those ladies. Um, and I just had something to say about it. Okay. Anyway, Heartstopper though. It made my little teen heart sore. It made my teen heart sore. Okay. Uh, that's all I have. That's all I have to say. 
It's fucking 945. You guys, we have things to do. It's Monday. Though I think a lot of things are still closed and people aren't doing anything. In which case, yes. Good. Good. Don't work today. It's 2023. Um, what are your New Year's resolutions? I want to hear. Mine is to be delusional. I don't know if you've seen all these TikTok girlies out there. You got to be delusional. Have delusional faith in yourself and who you are as a person and what you're going to accomplish and how, all the things you're going to achieve. you got to just be delusional. you got to walk into a room like you're the best fucking thing that ever happened. Because if you're not going to believe it in yourself, who is? So my New Year's resolution is to be delusional. Won't you join me? All right. That's all I have to say. I hope you guys have a lovely day. I will be back Thursday. We're back to our regular 8.30 a.m. Central Monday, Thursday schedule. Happy to be back. Um, thanks for waiting for me to come back. I appreciate that. And I hope you guys have a lovely week. I'll see you on Thursday. Moira's snoring, but she said goodbye. I know it. Okay, bye.